For those of you that are visiting with us, welcome. We're glad that you're here. We're thankful that it's a beautiful, beautiful day to worship the Lord to, together. And I pray that the, um, the songs that we were singing, the prayers that we were a part of, really shared a message about who we are as a church, because we really believe that God is a good Father. He loves us, cares for us, and that following His Son is the best way and truth of life that we can, that we can be a part of life. And so it is really, really good news. For those of you that are live streaming along with us, welcome. We're glad that you're able to join us uh, via that way. And, uh, and we pray that it's a blessing for you as well and that there's no weird internet issues as you're going through that. So um, we are in the midst of a series of looking at Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. He claimed that he is the only way to the Father. And he taught us really good lessons when he was here on earth. And we're in the midst of a series looking at the best, well, not maybe the best lesson that he taught, but the biggest lesson that he taught. When we look at Matthew chapter 5 through 7 and his sermon on the mount that he gives, and I love that Matthew was able to record that and give it to us in the way that he did um, for us to be able to look at this sermon and to look at how Jesus uh, um, gave it in such a way that it blesses and just gives truth in our lives as it shows the way. Because one of the truths that we have to recognize as we follow t Jesus is that he is a good teacher. He's the best teacher that has ever been here. And we've got to be honest with the truth that, well, I can say, I don't know if you can, but I can definitely speak from personal experience. I've had some bad teachers in my life. They m thought they were doing good, but they weren't. And when we read through the Sermon on the Mount, some of the things that we struggle with as we go through there, um, if we misunderstand Jesus, it may have a lot more to do with the bad lessons that we've had in life as opposed to the lesson that he's given and the fact that he believes that we can live into those lessons. He believes that we can live in his kingdom and be a part of it so much so that he gave his life that we can. And so there's really, really good news in that. So I want to share a psychological um, concept with us today that please don't use this to manipulate others. Like, and I do, Zach and I, and uh, a couple of others, I, I've used the term positive and negative manipulation before. I know some of us struggle with that, that idea. And so I don't plan on using that, but th don't use it in a negative way, please what I'm about to give you. It's the idea of a complex. You ever heard of that before? Essentially what a complex is, and it's used in a variety of ways in psychological uh, studies and uh, terminology, but the best way I understand it is simplistic, which is a complex is anytime somebody gives you uh, an idea over and over again, you tend to believe it. So one of the worst complexes you can give to a tall person is you keep telling them that they're short. Tell them short over and over again, they have the potential of unconsciously beginning to believe that, wishing that they were taller, wishing that they were this. We give ourselves complexes, by the way. Anybody like walk through the department store and see the mirror and go, who's that? That's because you have a complex of yourself that you've given yourself about what you look like as you walk past those mirrors. I immediately go, as I walk by those mirrors at the store because in my head I'm fit and trim and doing awesome But those mirrors tell me what is true what reality really is So one more time a complex is simply an idea that has been given to you over and over again that has shaped your perception your unconscious perception of reality Good teachers and bad teachers use that truth unconsciously Sometimes maybe they know it, sometimes they don't. But they use that truth and they have shaped your life because of that. And the best teachers, coaches, parents that you've had in your life have been ones that have spoken truth into your life where you've wanted to grow and go, all right, I can do more, I can do good. It's those coaches that when you were in a sports team, maybe you weren't the fastest on the team. He says, all right, you keep doing this, you keep running, or she, all right, you keep running, you're going to be faster and you're going to do good and it's going to be great. But those that have used the idea of complex negatively have said, you're never going to be good enough. You're never going to be fast enough to play this position on the team that you want to play. Or you're never going to be able to understand this concept in my class. You might as well just go ahead and go take an, find another teacher and take another class. And unfortunately, sometimes our brothers and sisters, our parents, our brothers and sisters in Christ have done that to us. So much so that when we read the Sermon on the Mount, we unconsciously 
when we listen to the teachings of Jesus, we unconsciously, or maybe subconsciously, it's, it doesn't really matter where it's at. It's really where our heart is. And Jesus calls us out on that when he says in the Sermon on the Mount over and over again that these are lessons of the heart. These are lessons that when he says, be perfect therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect, he's speaking into a truth of your unconscious that you can be what God what created you to be. Again, it goes back to the whole beginning where he says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He's not saying that you're not able to do this when he goes into the next list of lessons, which we talked about last week, that ends with, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. He's not saying, you can't do this. But unconsciously, what do we hear? You can't do this. Not all of us, but some of us hear that. Some of us just don't even connect with it, and we just go, that's too far out there. But Jesus believes in us, and he believes that his lessons can change our heart. This morning, um, as a couple of us were talking, it was wisely said in the, in the, in the conversation, is that where uh, your mind is is where your feet go. And I think Jesus would say it this way, where your heart is is where your actions come out from. And so I think there's a really important truth as we look on the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is calling us out not to be perfect in the sense that if you mess this up, you're never, ever going to make it. You're a failure. You don't ever get to be a child of God. Instead, he's calling us out and saying, all right, let's see where your heart is at. Because where your heart is at, there is where your directions are going. It'll be okay. He's the best teacher. He's not telling us that we're never going to be good enough. And how do we know that, by the way? that he's not saying that. Because he died for us. He died believing that we can follow him. That we can follow him as the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to the Father. He believes in us. And so since he believes in us to be like the teacher, because he was perfect, just like his father is perfect, that means that we can have a heart change. That unconscious change in ourselves where we can say, I am a child of God. I can sing a song like we sang earlier and said, you are a good, good father. That you lead me in the right paths, as uh, David says in his Psalms, past the salvation, past to the green pastures, where he is a good father in taking care of us. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. I want to show you some things that Jesus repeats here in uh, a good portion of Matthew chapter 6 that helps to point out this truth that you are good enough. Now, you have things to change. You can get better, but your heart can be right. Your heart can go in the right direction, following the way, and it will help you in these things even when you mess them up. So continue on. Because again, good teachers and coaches and parents and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters in Christ have spoken into our lives in the past where they've stepped up and said, (laughs) they didn't give us participation trophies. They said, hey, I see a struggle in your life, something that you need. You've got this. Fight through it. Whatever it takes, um, wrestle through it. Um, Build up the muscle that you need to be able to run faster, the heart that you need to be able to do better. You've got this. But we've also had some negative voices in our life that have essentially given us, some of us anyways, complexes that make us think that we're not going to make it. We're never going to be good enough. And Jesus is a good teacher just like those who have spoken up in your life, says, you've got this. You can live with this wisdom that I'm teaching you, that I'm giving you. Here's how he begins the section. Remember, he just got done saying, you therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So in the series of lessons, what we're going to notice is he keeps saying over and over again about getting a reward from your Father who is in heaven. Your Father who sees what is done in secret who is in heaven. He'll reward you. He'll take care of you. So he calls us out and he says, watch out. Don't do the things that you're doing in order to be praised, to be admired by others. Do it for him. Because where your heart is, is where your feet tend to go. 
He continues to say, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do at the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. Do you get how good this is? How he's not uh, building a complex and saying, hey, these are really horrible people, stay away, blah, blah. And he keeps saying, he keeps saying that they're doing good. He keeps speaking goodness into them. But then he says, here's where your heart should be, because it's more about the kingdom of heaven, that spiritual reality of the physical, than it is about only just the physical. Don't listen to the bad teachers that are only focused on what you can taste, smell, touch, see, and hear right now. But it's about the direction that you're going, that you really are following the way. He says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Okay? Again, complexes are usually given to people by repeating something over and over again, or having a thought over and over again. Notice what Jesus does here in this message. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand up and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. You hear the over and over again thing that's going on? He shows the negative, and he's going to get into the positive. But when you pray, go into your room, shut, your, shut the door, and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. He says, all right, are you going to be about the, the, the visual, the physical that's out there, or are you going to be about the truth of all of reality, of all of the kingdom of heaven that you get, get to be a part of? So chapter 5, he goes through this whole list of things that we need to learn in order to keep the law and be able to listen to the prophet, things like not being angry and not murdering, things like not committing adultery and definitely not lusting, things about keeping your promises by not making weird promises, things about um, right relationships between a husband and wife, and all that stuff. And he says, all right, here's the heart of the matter. Here's what will help you live those lessons. Trust in the Father who rewards you who sees everything that's going on. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. You hear what He keeps saying over and over again? Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. He knows you. He loves you. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is essentially a truth that you can live a righteous life in the kingdom of heaven now because God loves you. Plain and simple. He's taking care of you. He's right there for you. In the midst of the struggles, in the midst of the good things, in the midst of all aspects of life, He loves you. You're His daughter or you're His son, and He loves you. So he continues on and says this. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, that your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Essentially, if what you do in secret and what, where your feet go because of who you actually are, that the truth that you're living in about yourself is that God loves you and that your gods will be a part of who you are. It's just that simple. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We go back to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says, all right, all are invited. Everybody where they find themselves, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world because I am the fulfillment of the word. It's not going to disappear. And then we get into these lessons, and we go through and find out that Jesus has a concern that we're not just doing it just for show, that it really is every aspect of who we are. 
Essentially what he's saying is that mirror at the department store doesn't really dictate all of that you are. And I find that really interesting in a world that's so concerned about our visual appearance, about our actions as they are seen, about whatever 20 to 30 second video that we can post and whatever words we have said in the past, either through typing them out on some sort of social media thing or that um, maybe somebody has spied on whenever we text or set them over a phone or set them in person with video cameras watching us. And Jesus is just simply saying, God already knows it all anyways. <laughs> and he loves you. He sees everything done in secret. So wh where are you going? Where's your heart at? He continues on when he says this. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do you hear the repetitiveness over and over again about what his concern that we learn really is? That we get this unconsciously, subconsciously, and consciously? That our Father loves us? That he sees what's going on and rewards us? Did you catch that those who fast are like, hey, look at me, I'm fasting, that they, they're rewarded by the Father? And did you catch those that go throughout the day like it's a normal day? By the way, we don't anoint our head with oil very much anymore. It's not, not necessarily a common thing. It's a Middle Eastern practice. Maybe we should be saying, hey, when you put that gel or that hairspray in your hair this morning or actually ran a brush through it for once, that your father who sees what you're doing when you're fasting going about your day because it's between you and him and not everybody else, rewards you. Where's your heart at is what Jesus says. This is what the sermon is about. This is what the lesson is. Do you know who you are and what your purpose is and where you're going? Jim, I like that this morning. That was a good discussion. This is what Jesus is teaching us, that God loves us. And therefore, we can do better. We can live better. And it is a good thing. He continues on when he says this, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And most of us, especially us car guys, go, aw, what do you mean by this one? Well, if we keep reading into it, reading what Jesus says here, we might have something to learn about this. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, he's saying, all right, what is the real truth and grit of who you are? Is it, are you letting these things define who you are? Or are you letting your Father in heaven define who you are? Because he loves you. It's not saying you can't have any cars or vehicles at all or that never pick out the color that you want because that, that's going to definitely distract you and stuff. No, it, he's saying, if something happens to this car, the Father still loves you. If something happened to these clothes that make you look good, the Father still loves you. It doesn't matter if they get destroyed or damaged. The Father still loves you. So where is your heart? Do you still love the Father? Do you trust in him and look to him for everything? He continues on and says, The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Or we can kind of reword that a little bit if you want. You cannot serve God in the world that's without God. You're, you can only have one master. And so, if you serve the God that created all things, you end up with a heart treating all things, living into the life that you are loved, that things are good because God created them. But if you're not 
serving God as your master, trusting him as your father, and listening to the message, the teachings they have for, he has for you, these things get corrupted, and you misuse them, and it's bad, and it's never, ever good for you. And so Jesus teaches into that. And then he finishes it up with Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, which is such a good lesson for us that we need to get today. Because if we're going to believe this truth that God is a good father and he loves us, and where your heart is, there your treasures are, or as was said earlier today, where your heart is is where your feet tend to go, and we're gonna, our heart's going to be for God and his kingdom, we're going to struggle with a lot of stress and anxiety and the false complexes that the world gives us and distracts us and causes us to have so many problems. Look what Jesus says about it. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or how long the sermon's going to go and if everybody's going to fill up at the restaurants before you get, sorry, that's Ty Zola, Second Opinions, chapter 2, verse 8. <laughs> what you will eat or drink, nor about your body, how you look in that mirror when you're at the department store, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not more of more worth than they are? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... By the way, he's talking about bread there. For those of you that don't get it, that's where bread comes from. That's today is alive and tomorrow is tossed into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What are we going to eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Okay, please catch that. I, I pray that you catch that. This is what Jesus is teaching us. If we seek first, if we love God first and recognize first that we are his and our, our heart is taking us in the direction of the kingdom, he's not saying then there's not going to be any food, there's not going to be anything to drink, and you're, you're going to be naked the whole entire time. Did you catch that these things will be added to you? He's saying you don't have to worry about them. The complexes of the world don't shape you any longer. You don't go into the department stores looking for something to wear and go, oh, I can't get that even though I like it because so-and-so is going to hate it because they told me that they don't like this color on me or something like that. You're not going to go through any of those thoughts anymore. Instead, you're going to be like, Father, what do you like? God, you are good. You made me in your image, and you love me, and you sent your one and only son what about these people, other people that are here at the department store? How do I love my neighbor as myself as you called me out without being anxious about what they think about me or what they're doing? Instead, just being me. Or maybe as others that are supposed to be your coaches and teachers are saying you're never going to be good enough. They never ever say it forthrightly like that, by the way. Instead, it comes in snippets. It comes in things that they don't even realize you're hearing that way. And instead, you can go, all right, God, you love me. You believe in me. You believe I can be a whole lot better than I even know of myself and those complexes I've given myself. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to trust you. It's going to be good. I don't have to be anxious about this. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus calls us out into a life that recognizes the truth that you are loved. He teaches us this truth that the Father who sees what is done in secret, which is everything, rewards us in secret because you are loved. You were made by him. You were loved by him. You were given purpose by him to live and to love and to bless others and to worship him and take joy in his creation and use it accordingly with, with joy in loving him. And you have a hope that no matter what happens in this life, no matter if 
hunger or thirst or war or whatever it is in this life is coming, that you have a future, that you have a direction to go. And Jesus is the personification, is the complete example of all that when he gave up his life that we may have life and rose again on that third day. So I pray that you take the lessons of the Sermon on the Mount to heart, that you can live into them, that you can live a life with less and less and less anger, and eventually none, that you can live a life with less and less lust, and eventually none. You can live a life with right relationships. You can give a life where what you say is always true. Your yes is yes and your no is no. You can live a life where you give in a way that it doesn't matter what other people think about it because you know that God loves you. You can live a life where you're in, I love how Paul says it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, where you're praying continuously because you know your Father cares about you always. Now, it's hard. It's a challenge. It's a struggle. I recognize that. The things that Jesus, because I struggle with it, and the things that Jesus says here. But what he's calling us out, teaching us towards, is that we need to work on our hearts. We need to work on removing those complexes that have been given to us in life, where unconsciously, and the only way you're going to notice them is by starting consciously thinking about them, unconsciously, the world has told us, well, this is Satan's biggest tool. That's why his name in Hebrew, Hasatan, means accuser, which essentially he says, you're never going to be good enough, is what Satan wants you to think. And Jesus says, because the Father in heaven sees what you do in secret, you will be rewarded. He's essentially saying, because of who God is and because who you are, you are enough. Trust in that truth, because I came to die that you may know that. God loves you. He's a good, good father. He cares for us and um, gives us everything that we need. We don't have anything to be anxious about. Don't let the world distract you from that truth and give you false ideas about yourself that makes you think you're not going to be good enough because Jesus says in his sermon, you are. He ends his message by, and again, I encourage you, church, read sometime through this week, maybe once every day. Read Matthew chapter 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. He ends it by saying this parable that the wise man builds his house upon the rock, and the foolish man builds his house on the sand. He is that rock that he's talking about. He says it in Matthew chapter 16 when Peter replies that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. He says, on this rock, on this confession, I will build my church. Believe in that truth and follow that truth because it's going to take a while. I mean, it may not be until Jesus comes again that we get rid of all those complexes where we think we're not good enough. But if we keep our hearts focused on Jesus and that truth that God loves us and that God rewards us, and oftentimes when we don't even need it, it's not a participation trophy. It's a father loving his child reality that he's good all the time, that we'll live better lives and that we'll love our neighbors and even our enemies better every single day when we realize how good God is and how much he loves us. If you need prayer for anything, I ask you, I, I know it takes a lot of humility to come up if you're struggling with stuff. I know it's scary. Um, I'm scared every Sunday to get up in front of you guys. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's hard, but we're a family. We're a body of Christ. We're a group of people that are recognizing the truth that without Jesus, those complexes of the world got us. And in order to get rid of complexes, um, the way James says it is we have to confess our sins. It helps to remove that guilt, helps to remove those problems that are keeping us from recognizing the truth that the Father loves us. And he's taking care of us through Jesus. If you need prayer, I ask you to come forward and we'll pray together as a church. We'll, we'll be there to uplift each other. And if you've not followed Jesus and you believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, follow him in faith and follow him in baptism. Follow him in confession and follow him in seeking forgiveness and, and declaring that he is who he is with that confession that you have. Don't be shy. Don't be scared to do that either because it is a much better life as we follow him. Because the real, another good thing that Jesus ends up saying in John chapter 14 through 16 that helps to finish out the Sermon on the Mount for us is not only does God love us so much and want us to know he's his children, but he's provided a counselor for us, the Holy Spirit that we receive as a gift when we follow Jesus in baptism. So 
follow Jesus, be saved, follow him as a teacher and know that you are loved by a father who loves you. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face to you and give you his peace.